want you to hit me as hard as you can. There isn't a government on this planet that wouldn't kill us all for that thing. Hey everybody, this week on The Best Movie You Never Saw, we're taking a look back at Sneakers, a 1992 comedy heist movie starring Robert Redford, Sidney Poitier, Dan Aykroyd, Ben Kingsley, and the late River Phoenix. This movie was released in the very early days of the internet. You see, Sneakers even predates the Sandra Bullock movie The Net by a whole three years and features high-tech wizardry. Holy cow. Like floppy disks and dial-up modems, things that may seem ancient to younger audiences but evoke nostalgia for elder millennials like myself. We're getting too old for this. And sure enough, when we saw this movie as kids in the early 90s, we were blown away by the stuff they were doing and the gadgets that they were using. This thing was like James Bond. In the 10 year journey from idea to screenplay, it was not until Robert Redford came on board to star that the project began to attract talent in front of and behind the camera. Sneakers mark Redford's first leading role in a studio film since 1990's big flop, Havana. It also hit theaters only one month before Redford's Oscar-winning directorial effort, A River Runs Through It. With a cast populated by Oscar nominees and winners directed by Phil Alden Robinson, best known for helming Field of Dreams and The Sum of All Fears, Sneakers would go on to become a moderate box office success, grossing $105 million worldwide against the $23 million budget. Critics were lukewarm when Sneakers debuted. I've had a bad night. Really? With many citing a pleasant sense of humor, loose tone, and cheerfulness despite tension in the right moments. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. How are you? <sighs> <sighs> Roger Ebert was unimpressed and gave it two and a half stars, calling the film thin. It retains a fresh reading on Rotten Tomato, and even as recently as 2016, NBC was developing a series adaptation of it. However, I wager that most modern film audiences, at least those of us who didn't grow up in the 80s and 90s, haven't seen the film. Written by Lawrence Lasker and Walter F. Parks, Sneakers was first developed when the duo scripted the 1983 hacking classic War Games. Shall we play a game? Oh. That film, directed by John Badham, was heavily rooted in real-world technology, something that would play a factor in sneakers as well. Computer scientist Leonard Aldman, one of the creators of the renowned encryption technology RSA, he's the A, was the mathematical consultant on sneakers. Aldman joined the project to lend realism to the hacking scenes and built slides featuring unbreakable codes. Adelman took the job primarily so that his wife would get the chance to meet Robert Redford. And I mean... Look at him. You get all the fun stuff. Sneakers is a movie that is aimed at adult audiences, especially with the median age of the cast being in at around 50. That said, as a kid, I thought this was the greatest movie ever. Aside from the presence of River Phoenix, the film is pretty mature and adult-oriented, although it still managed to only get about a PG-13 because there's actually not much violence in the film. Phoenix himself apparently took the role purely for the paycheck as it was a light gig in contrast to the psychological torture he experienced on his prior film, 1991's My Own Private Idaho. To avoid the film from being considered a kid-friendly movie, Phil Alden Robinson intentionally had profanity added to keep it from earning a PG because the PG rating was seen as the kiss of death. If you love him. If you love him. If you love him. And give him head whenever he wants. Give him head. This is likely the reason the movie remains so underappreciated to this day. It didn't have the young stars of Wargame or the action of Mission Impossible. This was a movie that appealed to fans of the cast rather than the material. Those who've watched this movie know that it's a balance of heavy techno speak with a heist element that really makes this the nerdy version of Ocean's Eleven. Robert Redford, however, is the coolest he had been in years as Martin Bishop, whose name is a nod to names on the lists featured in Three Days of the Condor, which also stars Redford and is a techno thriller. He leads a small company in this movie who break into places to show the holes in their security system. A pair of men show up claiming to be with the NSA and reveal they know about Martin Bishop's true identity. Because you see, 
he was a hippie in the 1960s who hacked into a government computer and is now on the run from the FBI. Call us at this number. Mr. Bryce. Now, in exchange for keeping his secret, the NSA want Redford and his crew to steal a black box that ends up being the ultimate code-breaking device. And it's worth noting that during production, Robinson was actually visited by representatives from the Office of Naval Intelligence who cited national security concerns with the black box featured in the movie. This threw Robinson as the movie hinges on such a device, and it was not until he met with Universal Studios' legal counsel that he discovered it was just a prank. To this day, it remains unclear who set up the elaborate joke, but all signs point to either Redford or co-star Dan Aykroyd. Now, the camaraderie evident behind the scenes is very visible in the finished film. Every cast member looks to be having fun in the roles. Redford naturally is the debonair leading man. His Devil May Care persona is balanced by Sidney Poitier, here playing the more buttoned-down straight man opposite Redford's loose cannon. Poitier, who had previously starred with River Phoenix in the 1998 neo-noir Little Nikita, was coming off the abysmal failure of what would be his final directorial effort, the 1990 Bill Cosby comedy Ghost Dad. Here he plays Donald Kreese, a family man and the voice of reason in the group. When I originally watched this movie, I didn't appreciate the comic timing that Poitier brings to his performance, but recently watching it made me want so badly for more roles like this from the legendary actor. Seeing him deliver the line, Motherfuckers mess with me, I'll split your head! Harkens back to some, of, to some of Poitier's most famous lines, including, of course, They call me Mr. Tibbs. And is the most badass moment in the movie. The same can be said for both Dan Aykroyd and David Strathairn, who play Darren Roscoff, aka Mother, and Erwin Emery, aka Whistler, respectively. Both men dive into their more neurotic characters, who are written to be comic relief, yet have much more depth to them. Fellas, Janet's little black box is on his desk between the pencil jar and the lamp. Uh, Whistler, I, I hate to tell you this, but you're blind. Aykroyd, a renowned believer in the paranormal and conspiracy theories, gets to play with these tall tales, including references to using technology that was part of faking the Apollo moon landing. This LTX-71 concealable mic is part of the same system that NASA used when they faked the Apollo moon landings. Yeah, the astronauts broadcast around the world from a soundstage at Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, California. Strathairn plays Whistler, a blind computer hacker, as something of a smartass, but one who earns the respect of his teammates. Portraying a blind person hacking computers is not the most cinematic concept, but close-ups on Strathairn's face and creative editing with his braille-friendly computer keyboard end up delivering some pretty well-executed moments. And of course, there's a car chase, and Whistler's driving, and he's blind. It's crazy. What follows is Redford and his team assembling the crew, including Martin's ex, played by the lovely Mary McDonnell, who factors into one of the film's most memorable sequences. The key to breaking into the lab requires the voice print of Werner Brands, played by character actor extraordinaire Stephen Tobolowski. Liz, played by McDonnell, goes on a date with him and must get him to say a series of words that Bishop's team can assemble into the needed passphrase. From dinner at a Chinese restaurant back to an intimate encounter, him and Liz interact while the team observes from a distance. The scenes are intense as they are hilarious, and Tobolowski apparently said during the 20th anniversary retrospective that he improvised a lot of his dialogue because Phil Aiden Robinson, the director, just told him to do anything that he could to make Mary McDonnell laugh. I really love the sound of your voice. Really? I always thought it was kind of nasal and pinched. Eventually, the film reveals the big twist that involves Sir Ben Kingsley doing one of the oddest accents of his career. The world isn't run by weapons anymore, or energy, or money. It's run by little ones and zeros, little bits of data. Kingsley plays Cosmo, the former partner of Martin Bishop, who has turned to the dark side thanks to being abandoned by his friend. Think of their dynamic as what would have happened if somebody double-crossed Bill Gates or Steve Jobs and you have Kingsley's Cosmo. His limited screen time is used efficiently and sets the table for Kingsley's future villain turn as Trevor Slattery in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But I guess the less said about his role in Iron Man 3, the better. Don't hurt the face, I'm an actor. The Mandarin, see, it's not real. While Kingsley's appearance in the original film was a bit surprising, seeing as how the Oscar-winning Gandhi actor was more associated 
with marquee and artsy fare, his inclusion in sneakers is another example of how the talent behind the scenes took this opportunity to work with their peers and have some fun. I mean, think about the fact that sneakers counts three Oscar winners and five nominees in the cast, and Tobolowski mentioned that during production, the actors went virtually unrecognized on set as Universal Studio visitors were more focused on the sets from E.T. and Jaws to notice the parade of stars in front of them. Having grown up appreciating the films of Redford, Poitier, Kingsley, as well as of course Phoenix, the late Great River Phoenix, McDonald and David Strathairn, and even newcomer Donald Logue, who has a nice little part in this movie, this was and remains an impressively star-studded cast. It's interesting to note that as far as action goes, the movie relies much more on intense moments in bands and back offices rather than gunplay or combat. It may all seem quaint considering how primitive the technology looks compared to what we have today, and steeped in old school hacking and phone freaking, Sneaker still manages to age pretty well despite modern audiences going into it with internet access on the touchscreen smartphones. For those of us from the old days of dial-up modems and AOL, Sneakers is a bit of a blast from the past. Chalk full of Easter egg references to movies like Back to the Future, THX 1138, The Manhattan Project, The Conversation, The Hunt for Red October, and many more, Sneakers is much funnier than you would think and far more entertaining than the bland poster makes it out to be. There are tons of quotable lines throughout the movie, but I guarantee you, you find yourself saying too many secrets or my voice is my passport and verify me. My voice is my passport, verify This is a film full of data technology that should not hold up, but thanks to an impeccable cast who are having the time of their lives, it does. We're the good guys, Marty. Gee, I can't tell you what a relief that is, Dick. Thank you for watching the best movie you never saw. If you like this kind of content, make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support.